Hey everyone, thank you for joining the Truth Produces Freedom podcast. I'm, I'm just going to jump straight in uh, to the, the subject we've been walking in and um, just see where it leads us and uh, may start to go in a little bit of a, a different direction, but we'll, we'll just see. So um, I wanted to continue to talk about obedience and how God, He gives us grace to obey. He gives us the grace an ability to obey. The power source is Him. The Holy Spirit is, is the only way. Um, and it's only through relationship. It's not through law. It's through grace. You know, your sin shall have no dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And the exact context of that in Romans 6 is walking in righteousness, presenting your members as instruments of righteousness um, and considering and reckoning yourself dead indeed to sin. And so I just want to kind of dig more into that, how, how he gives us grace for obedience. He gives us the grace and ability to obey him. So when Jesus said, go and sin no more, when he said no more, he means exactly that. He meant no more. And, and no more really means no more. Never again. To sin no more would mean to no longer be in any sin. To no longer be walking in sin, but to be walking in truth and in freedom. To be living and walking in righteousness. To be following in the footsteps of Christ. So, so you might ask, like, so you do you mean it's possible to never sin again? <sighs> hmm. Is that what I'm saying? Do you mean it's possible to never sin again? Well, I'll just share my thoughts and my perspective on it. According to the Lord Jesus Christ who is the eternal God and creator of all things, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yes, it is. He certainly believes so, as he has spoken thus, Go and sin no more. He certainly believes so. And, and he believes that his own blood that he shed on our behalf was sufficient. So I, I think it's possible, yes. I'm not saying that we won't ever sin again and that, or that we never could sin again, but He has called us in righteousness and truth and into obedience, and He has called us to go and sin no more. He has paid the price to set us free, and I think it is possible because of what He has said. It, it's our decision to, to believe Him and walk in that or not. And we may not walk in it. We may stumble, but we don't have to. That's the, that's the main point. Is He destroyed the sin problem, and we need to believe that. That he, His resurrection is more powerful than, than the fall of man. And so, we never... The, the point is, we never have to sin again. I'm not saying that you never will or you never could, but it is possible to not sin. You don't have to sin. You don't wake up sinning every day. We're not damned and doomed to sin. That is not what the Bible teaches. We never have to sin ever again. We were, we were never meant to sin. It was a lie. Sin was a lie. And Jesus came to remove it and replace it with truth. We are not bound or destined to commit sin. We never, ever have to sin again. Again, I, I just want to clarify, I'm not saying that we never, ever will, or we never could. I'm saying we don't have to, and it's possible to obey Him. That's the main point. It is possible to obey God. I believe with all my heart that I 
that, that because of what God says, not because of my own sufficiency or being better than anyone else or any or any or pride, this is this is like one of the most humbling things to experience is is to believe him. It is it is a humbling thing. And so I believe what he says, and if he says go and sin no more, if he says walk in my commandments, if he says do this, do that, live in righteousness, like all the commandments of God that are not burdensome, I believe Him and that He will give the grace to make that possible. And I can choose to walk in that. I could choose not to, but I can choose to. And so, we we never have to sin again. We're not doomed to. Jesus really meant sin no more when he said it. it. It sounds to me like the scripture that says we are never tempted beyond what we can bear is actually true. 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation has come upon you except that which is com- is common to man but god is faithful who who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will he will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it he said paul said that no temptation has come upon us that is not common. But God is faithful and He will never allow us, He will never allow the enemy to tempt us beyond what we are able. He says that we are able. That that is His grace that makes us able. And we are able to obey through His grace. Of course we can't without Him. We can't without His Holy Spirit, without His grace. It's impossible. Without forgiveness, and the gift of repentance, there is no possibility of change or transformation. His mercy, His forgiveness, His grace is the only way to be changed. It is the only way. But His grace and His mercy, His forgiveness is designed to put integrity back inside of us, to transform us, to change us. It is, it do, his grace does not want to leave anything the same. His grace wants to transform everything it touches, everything that embraces it. If we embrace His grace, it will change us. It'll it'll transform everything. So God, He's faithful and will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. But when temptation comes, God will provide the way of escape, a way out that we may be able to bear it. He will every time. That to me sounds like it's possible to choose to go and sin no more in each situation. Doesn't mean you'll never stumble, but you don't have to. And it's possible not to. And you can live in freedom. You can believe God. I I mean, just we need to just imagine what it would be like if we had full faith and believed God in these matters and if we let if we fully embraced his grace his forgiveness and let grace have its work in us what is possible he he doesn't leave us bound our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we would no longer be slaves to sin The, the Lord is a faithful, a faithful and just God. He never gives us a commandment without giving us the grace to obey the commandment. His commandments are not burdensome. We're never tempted beyond what we can bear. We are called to go poriomai and sin no more. That, the Greek word poriomai, the go 
the launching of God, the buying of your train ticket and putting you on, on the train into your new life of freedom. We, we died with Christ. Our old self died with Him so that, our, that we could walk in newness of life. We were died with Him and then we rose with Him so that we might walk in newness of life. But he gives us the grace to obey his commandment. The moment he, when he gives us a, a commandment, he gives us the grace to obey that commandment. If he didn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be just. The Lord would not be a just God if he gave us commandments that we cannot obey. The Lord doesn't give us a command in order to set us up to fail and to disobey Him. That is not how He works. That is not our God. He does not give us a commandment in order to set us up to fail and to disobey Him. Why would you, why would you ever be held accountable for disobeying a command if you weren't even able to obey the command in the first place? If you weren't even able to obey the command in the first place, why would you ever be held accountable for disobeying it? Wouldn't it be the Lord's fault and not your fault? Wouldn't it be the Lord's fault for giving you the impossible command? Isn't it strange how, how we treat God's words and commandments given to us as if it is God telling us to, telling us to fly though we're humans or to or to breathe to breathe water when we can only breathe oxygen like that's how like it seems like that's what people treat god's words and commands as and you say well well you can't you can't do those things without you, you can't obey his commands without him okay well, well, well let me just entertain that for a second okay so if his commands are like these impossible things like telling a human to fly or to breathe water he gives us the ability to fly or to breathe water then in that case. He will, give, he will provide the tools. He will give us the grace to obey. Well, when you put it that way, like, you know, it sounds silly to people when I put it like that, you know. It's like, like God telling us to fly or, even though we can't fly or to breathe water even though we can't breathe water. But that's, that's literally like the way people view God's commands. They think they're impossible, but they're not. They're, they're not burdensome. In fact, he said, you're never tempted beyond what you can bear. And he always provides a way out. <laughs> and he, we are able, we are able to obey because he has enabled us. He has empowered us. He is able to make us able. And, and people, yeah, they, they think it's, yeah, they just think it's impossible. And it's really what believers do with Scripture. They really do treat it like that. They think it's impossible. They think, they think it's God telling us to fly when we can't. It's impossible. We, we call it unattainable and say, only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do it. And, and with a false humility. We have a false humility when we, when we say those things. We, we, call, we call it unattainable and we tell, we're saying that God's words are not true. We're saying, no, that's impossible. I, we, we can't go and sin no more. We can't obey Him. We can't love our neighbor. We can't do this. We can't do that. Like You can't just rip out and pick and choose what commands and words of God are possible and which ones aren't. We can't do that. It's ridiculous. And we, we call it unattainable and we say, only, oh, well, only Jesus can do that. And it's a, it's a false humility. And, and this is not what God is saying or how He wants you to think. Not at all. It's not at all what, how God wants you to think. Humility. <laughs> See, this, this is 
one of the most humbling things is to to believe God, like to hear what these words and these commands of God and like for him to say, go and sin no more. That humbles you. That doesn't make you prideful and go, ha ha, I'd, I'm never going to sin again. That's not what that does. The, the words of God, the commands of God, the grace of God is designed. His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness changes everything. It changes the story. And His grace is designed to put integrity back inside of the believer, of the person that is born again. We've been born again. Again, and it's crazy to me how people f- use that term and think that we're born again into the same corruption, into the same sinfulness, into the same as before we were born again. That makes no sense. We are born again. And when we hear these amazing words and commands of God, it causes humility. And humility, here's, here's true humility. So humility is not this false thing that says, oh, that's impossible, unattainable. I am weak and, and sinful and disgusting. And I, I can't do that. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can walk in the commands of God. And that's a, that's a false humility. The Bible does not say to keep a sin identity like that. The Bible says to reckon yourself indeed dead to sin. The Bible says to present your members to righteousness. To see yourself the way that God does. To look at the mirror of His Word and not forget what you look like. So when you see the Bible, you see the Word of God the way James 1 says. You see the Bible and it reveals your identity. It doesn't show you... See, people... I've heard people misquote and mis... They, they, they just wrongly teach that James 1 passage. And they, they read it as, okay, the Bible's a mirror. And then they look at that you know, comparison, and then they forget about what that passage says, and then they're like, okay, the Bible's a mirror, and so you look at a mirror, and then it shows you what's wrong with you, so that you can, like, fix your hair, and, like, you know, it, it like, shows you your faults, and what's wrong with you, and, and so that you can clean your act up, or something, like, people treat it like that, that's not what it says, James 1, it says that, well, let's just look at it, Here's what James 1 says, starting in verse 18. I'm reading in the, the New American Standard Bible. It says, In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. Mm, truth. He brought us forth by the word of truth, the reality of the kingdom, the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. This you know, my beloved brethren. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, woe, all, put aside all that remains of of wickedness. This is another go and sin no more verse. That put aside, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Wow. So here is that word humility. Being, like he uses the word humility, which I was just talking about. I didn't even realize that when I was opening this up. So humility receives the word. Humility puts aside filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Wow. So it is humility to believe God. Believe your identity. The identity He's given you. Putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. In humility receive the word implanted. What's the word implanted? What God says who He says you are, His commandments, His instructions for your life. The Bible, the Word of God, is the implanted Word that is deep inside of you. And that is able 
to save your souls, he says. And that is able to purify you and cause you in humility to put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. So receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. There is true restoration of our souls, mind, will, and emotions. True salvation of our souls. And then he says, but prove yourselves. B is another, uh, another other translation say, but be doers of the word. Be doers of the word. That's identity. Be be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. He has forgotten what he looks like. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Wow. So reason why I wanted to go through all that is just to show you what I was about to say about it is James describes the Word of God as a mirror that shows you who you truly are. So when you read what God says about you, when you read His commandments, when you read His words, instructions to you, it reveals who you are. It is a mirror that shows you the real you. It's not to show you what's wrong with you. It's to reveal identity. He says, if we look at the word and see what it says, but don't do what it says, it proves an identity that is, it's an identity crisis. Because he says, looking, like hearing what God says, seeing the word, Hearing it only and not obeying it, walking in it, doing what it says, being a doer of the word. We're like a man who looks at his own face in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. So the Bible is the mirror that reveals to us and, and shows us what we really look like. So it reveals who we really are. It reveals our identity. And if we're not walking and producing the fruit of holiness, if we're not doing what the Word says, being doers of the Word, we're looking at the Scripture, we're looking at His commands, the things that He says, when He says, go and sin no more, when He says, love your neighbor, when He says, go into all the world, when, when He says all the commandments that are not burdensome, and we don't believe Him and don't obey Him and we're not doers of the Word, we're forgetting what we look like. We're, we're seeing in the Bible, our nat it says, our natural face. We're observing our natural face in a mirror. Our new identity, our new nature, because He made us new, a new creation. We are new creatures. And if we do that, we're, or if we don't do that, we're not doers of the Word. We're looking at His commands and, and what He says in the Bible, who He says we are, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror, seeing who we really are, and then we're walking away and forgetting what we look like. But I just that, that just took me in a direction. I, I just had to go with that. And so the point is I was getting to is like this passage even touched on, is humility believes God. Humility believes what He says about us. Humility does not deny what He says about us and embrace all these lies of the enemy and calling it humility. It is false. It's not what God is saying or how He wants you to think. 
Humility believes God. Humility believes and trusts God's words with confidence. Humility doesn't disregard God's grace that empowers that empowers us. Humility doesn't disregard God's grace, His empowering grace, and render it ineffective. That's not humility. Humility embraces it. Humility embraces it, but, but always, humility always acknowledges the source and, his, and the beautiful mercy and grace. Humility is never self-sufficient. It, humility is never self-pride. It's, it's humility is believing in God and His words. It's faith in Him, what He says. It is not self-promotion. It is not self-sufficient apart from God. That is not that yeah. Um, so Jesus, he he gives us the grace and full ability to obey every command that he gives us. He he empowers us to do just as he says to do. God is just to forgive us of all sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that he does this so that we are made into being completely righteous to the core a new identity a new face that we can look in the mirror and see and know who we are because we're only defined by him We're only defined by His words, by His sacrifice, His bloodshed, His resurrection, His ascension, His sending of the Holy Spirit. We're only defined by His victory. A new identity, looking in the mirror, seeing who we truly are now. He has made us righteous to the core. It is His doing. Jesus is just and he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1.3 His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. He has given, His divine power has given to us all things, to that all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we can live true life and we can live in godliness because of His divine empowerment, because of His grace. It is not our own doing, it is not our own ability, it is His ability. He he will empower us through our faith and trust in Him and seeing our identity clear, seeing ourselves forgiven of sin. We can walk in victory. We can go and sin no more. It'll change everything if we believe Him, if we believe that we are forgiven of all. And He has cleansed us of all unrighteousness what's what's left if we're cleansed of all unrighteousness what remains righteousness and if we believe that believe the mirror of the word when we read scriptures like that we will become doers of that word and live it out of our true identity seeing our true face And not being a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. Hmm. I'm just going to read the rest of that in James and kind of wrap wrap this episode up. But so one who looks, so he said, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. 
for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. That, so he's saying that's what's happening. If we're hearing the word of God and not having an identity of being a doer of the word of God, that's what's happening. You're looking in the mirror and seeing your identity when you look at the Bible. And then you're walking away and forgetting what you look like. You're forgetting your identity. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, it's the law of liberty now in the new covenant, it's not the Old Testament law of bondage, the law that cannot be followed or obeyed. We have the Holy Spirit now. We have the blood of Christ. We have the victory of heaven. We have the resurrection overcoming the fall of man. And he says, the law of liberty, the one who intently at the perfect, well, the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty and abides in it, abides in the law of liberty. Because it's not, a, it's not commandments that are burdensome. It's liberty. So the one who intently looks at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will, will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. Wow. <laughs> so if it's not producing transformation and freedom, it's worthless. I mean, basically, <laughs> that's what he... Wow, that's basically what he's saying here. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, does not take control of these things, does not believe and walk in victory, does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Then he says, pure and undefiled religion, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. this so this, this right here is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father. This is it. To visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We, we can be unstained by the world. We can keep ourselves unstained by the world. That is a true faith. That is a true pursuit of faith. That is a true God ordained, God approved religion. That is <laughs> that is worth practicing. Visiting orphans and widows in their distress. So I think that just really shows compassion and love and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So we can be unstained by the world. He tells us to go and sin no more. We can be unstained by the world. We are in the world, but not of it. Who is it that overcomes the world? He who believes Jesus is the Christ. His commands are not burdensome, for the one who believes in Christ has overcome come the world and the victory that has overcome the world is our faith like we read in first john in one of the previous episodes so we can keep ourselves unstained by the world and when i think when i think of this concept of being in the world but not of it and being unstained by the world jesus said i don't pray that you would take them out of the world father i pray that you would protect them from the evil one so he wants us in the world but not of the world. He wants us in the world and protected from the evil one, kept away from the sinful ways of the world, unstained by the world. When I think when I think of this concept, I I I think of it when I hear the story in the book of Daniel about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And when they refuse to bow to Nebuchadnezzar and they throw them in the furnace and, you know, the angel, uh, you know, it's most likely, it, it, it sounds like it's Jesus himself in there. It, it looks like a, a son of the gods is what Nebuchadnezzar says. And so we equate that to being Jesus in the fire with them. And when it says, when they escape out of the fire, they were in that fire, but when they escape out of the fire, it says that there was no burns on them. And, and then it's, and it says there was no, or their clothes were not burned or anything was affected by the fire. But, and then it says there was no smell of smoke on them. So they were unaffected by the fire. They were unstained by the world. That's the comparison, I, the visual I love on that, that concept. That we're in the world and not of it. Like Jesus said, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so to be unstained by the world is living in the supernatural power of God and being, and being like being thrown in the fire, but not having any smell of smoke. So we're in the world, in the fire and junk of the world. But we have no smell of smoke. We're protected. And so I think I'm going to just end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining uh, this week's episode of the Truth Produces Freedom podcast. Um, you can uh, you can find me on Facebook, Jonah Smith Preachings and Teachings. I'm on WordPress blog under the the podcast name and this podcast you can find um, anywhere that you get that you can get podcasts and and I'm on YouTube as well under the podcast name. Um, so thank you so much for joining. I just pray freedom over your life. I hope that this is blessing you and helping you see your identity more clearly and that you'll see the word in the mirror of the word and not be a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer of the word. So God, thank you for the listeners. I pray their hearts would be softened, that you'd make them good soil, God. You say, Lord, there's only four types of people in the world. You've got the the uh, rocky soil, you've got soil filled with thorns, and you've got, tra- you've got trampled soil, and you've got good and rich soil. And I pray, Lord, that the listeners would, would, would soften and that any rocky soil would be... Would be uh, changed into soft soil that any trampled soil would be would be turned into soft soil and any thorns covering the soil would be destroyed and they would become good soil that can receive your word and produce abundant fruit for the kingdom thank you father for your children and your mighty love for them we lift we lift them up to you in jesus name thank you father amen thank you for listening